103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio, 103.9 LP FM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today is April 25th, 2021. And as usual, we have the Wombat on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. What's Scott eating? I must know. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm eating some scrambled, some scrambled eggs, baby. All right, all right, all right. Scott, also known as Doubtfire, is with us today. George Brooklyn is here. Hello, and Hi. Dread Pirate Higgs. Oh. Hello, Dread. Brooklyn Brown. And Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll also talk about religion, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition. Wombat, what are we going to be talking about today? I think we're going to be talking about Mickey Mouse and, what? and yeah, like what? Anthrop- <laughs> animals with finger hands. I think that's what anthropomorphic is. I'm not too sure, but we'll find out in this show. Before we get into it, I'll throw it up to our own Dread Pirate Higgs for our weekly invocation. All right. Well, here's a clue of okay. who it's coming from. All right. Our audience. For our listeners, it's a shirt that's it's like a Venn diagram that has life, universe, and everything underneath it. And in the middle, it says 42. It's a Hitchhiker's Guide uh, mm-hmm. call out, which is a yeah. good book. You should read it. I, I recommend yeah. it. Oh, it's excellent. an excellent book. Mm-hmm. So in, in keeping with the, uh, the, the uh, topic for today, I got my imagine a puddle waking up one morning and thinking, this is an interesting world I find myself in. An interesting hole I find myself in yep. fits me rather neatly, doesn't it? Mm. In fact, it fits me staggeringly well. Must have been made for me in the... Must have been made to have me in it. This is such a powerful idea that as the sun rises in the sky and the air heats up, and as gradually the puddle gets smaller and smaller, it's still frantically hanging on to the notion that everything's going to be all right because this world was meant to have him in it, was built to have him in it. So the moment he disappears catches him rather by surprise. I think this may be something we need to be on the watch for. Yeah. Douglas Adams. So good. So good. That story stuck with me on a lot of levels because I love analogies, right? And, you know, we were talking just yesterday about the idea of mind and body and a lot of people describe themselves as like separate from their body like i'm a mind or i'm a i'm a personality that's just inhabiting this body and how fortunate am i to be a human being among all the other animals i could have been a blade of grass i could have been a cat i could have been an amoeba but i got to be the, the apex animal on the planet in this time period wow wonderful and i always thought how can i describe in a simple way that it's not so much that you were in a lobby and got to choose to be human. You didn't push the human button when it was your turn to come out. There was a human being and the human has mental processes to keep itself sane and functional. And that's you. (laughs) (laughs) You are a bar. Your moral, your personality is a byproduct of your body, not the other way around. So it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Humanity. Uh, Hey, I want to talk about that though. Uh, We're talking about Mickey Mouse, right? And and Goofy, and Donald Duck, and all these animals that have, like, human parts. I don't understand anthropomorphism. I understand that it's a very big thing in the internet. I try to stay away from those websites. Dread Pirate, help me out. Uh What's what's this anthropomorphic thing? Well, um, so I I think we we might be getting confused or conflating two things here. So anthropomorphism is not the same thing as the anthropic principle. Oh, okay. We're going to talk about, so. Talk to me. Um, well, the anthropic principle is sort of the position that, um, you know, with all the, the uh, constants being appearing so fine-tuned that the universe uh, was actually kind of made for humans to perceive it. And if it was any other way, we wouldn't be able to. By constants, you mean physical constants. Yeah, uh, like phys- constants in physics, yes. Yeah. And there's, and there's a bunch of them. Give me an example. 
an example? Yeah. The charge, of, the charge of an electron or yep. uh, the strength of the strength gravity. Of a, yeah. It or, all seems or, to be finely tuned for the existence of humankind. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so or even the uh, the expansion of the universe in the, in, in the earlier universe. Well, if, that's what the it had been principle. If it had been, yeah, exactly. If it had been, you know, one millionth millionth of percent off of what it is, the universe would have collapsed and we wouldn't be here to talk about it. Well, I'm, I actually have a bizarre concept now because you're saying... I, and I've heard this before. So you're saying if gravity wasn't the num the rate at it actually was, and if we weren't carbon-based life forms, but instead silicon-based life forms, you're saying all these variables that are quantitative that seem to be very, very exact weren't deliberately made. What are you What are you talking about? And how does Mickey Mouse fall into all of this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really okay. Well, I, I've got it. I've got it up here on, on Rational Wiki. Okay. And uh, so the, the quick definition here is the anthropic principle is often is an oft misunderstood philosophical proposition that has many variations. Two commonly cited variations are Carter's weak and strong anthropic principles. The weak uh, anthropic principle states that humans live in an, an inherently unique part of the universe because humans require unique conditions to live and exist. The strong anthropic principle essentially states that our universe and its fundamental constants must exist at some point in the universe's history in such a way that it allows the creation of observers. In other words, in order for the universe to be observed, the universe must exist in a state that allows you observers to exist. Mm, that sounds like one of those, what do you call it? Uh, uh, like apologies? I'm apologizing for the fact yeah, that yeah. <laughs> it's it very well. It does. I'm pleading. So it, 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 it's, like it, pleading. it is, it's kind of tautological, right? You know, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind yeah. of a circular, sure, sure, circular sure, sure. thing. It's basically God exists because the universe was made for us to exist in it because God exists to make the universe that <laughs> exists in it. Therefore God exists. Yes. Perfect right. sense. Right? <laughs> Perfect sense. And if you're confused, that just means, you got to open up your heart a little bit wider. Right. You got to eat your Wheaties. I would like to get some other opinions on this. Scott, what do you think about the anthropomorphic principle? What do you call this thing? The Mickey Mouse principle? Can we just call it that? You know? Anthropic. Anthropic. Anthropic principle. Anthropic. Scott, yeah. ideas, thoughts. Yeah. So uh, what many theists will argue is that, um, you know, the, the very reason we're here and we're talking about this is because the universe is at a very fine tuned um, state. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it's just really, it strikes them as very odd that the universe would just come to exist in just the right way. It could have existed in any other way. There's an infinite amount of um, different configurations that the universe could have existed of course, maybe life wouldn't be here. Um, definitely wouldn't be here. Um, you can actually break that down and scientists have. It's, it's, fine tuning isn't a religious um, concept. It's a scientific concept. It's, it's, it comes from science. It's called the fine tuning um, of the universe. Hmm. But what, the, what theologians have done is they've kind of taken this route to say, well, if the, f the universe is fine-tuned, then this sort of points to a uh, God. A that, tuner. A tuner, a fine-tuner, because <laughs> it could have been any other way. Why? Why? The question is, why is the universe this way that accounts for us being here and not those infinitely other ways? Right. And so you've got these other, the response to that has been, well, Maybe we're in a multiverse. Maybe it's string theory. That, oh, my you know, gosh. All, but you then, don't don't uh, just say the, things. Right. <laughs> so then the theologians will say, yeah, but, you know, those aren't, those are just as religious and just as unfounded as, you know, the alternative. So they're saying that, you know, the, the most parsimonious answer would be God, because we're looking at something more simple than trying to, extract all these infinite amount of universes right and as and as much as i have an issue with string theory and as much as i have an issue with multiverse right people who misuse them as like a, a catch-all term to answer everything else yeah. god is like the most complex thing you can bring into a conversation 
as a catch-all answer to everything. It is literally the most complex thing you can card you can play. It is the most mm-hmm. biggest unanswered, most assuming. Well, there's two things that I have on Occam's that. Occam's razor thing. Not wrong. There's, there's, What's up? there's two things that I have on that, which you just said. Talk to um, me. There's two problems right here. Number one, it seems to me that if we live in a fine-tuned universe, that means that God must have been fine-tuned. Who fine-tuned God? Oh, no. Okay. Because now it seems like he's constrained, too, by the constants, yeah. right? And yeah. then, then the yeah. whole yeah. argument kind of dwindles away, kind of dissolves away. Yeah, because what if it was two gods? Wasn't it perfect that we just have one fine-tuner? Right. And isn't that fine-tuner who made the one fine-tuner? Like there the you go. There you go. See, See here's the, the Russian dolls, dolls again. It's the yeah. Russian dolls again, right? Yeah. It's a super god. <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah, how, how, yeah. Yeah. Russian dolls, exactly. And what's the second one, Scott? Well, that was it. That, 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 there's that, how, and what? the uh, God is constrained <laughs> by fine tuning. So, it, it, you know, it, put it this way: right. they say fine tuning is proof of the supernatural God, the fine tuner, right? But it seems like this is more of an argument for naturalism. Because it would be supernatural if God allows life despite the universe not being fine-tuned. That would be a miracle if there's life in the universe without nature being a certain way. But because nature is a certain way, it allows for life. That only points to naturalism. So does that make sense? No. <laughs> I'm trying to follow on. <laughs> I, like, I like the words you're saying, and I'm sure there's a point there that I can follow. Could you try again? Could you, like, could you, could you crystallize okay. that again? So, this, so I got this from Sean Carroll's debate right. with William Lane Craig Just about fine tuning. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so William Lane Craig says the universe is fine tuned. This points to God. Being okay, the yep. fine tuner, and God right, right. is all powerful, all knowing, and that's why it's fine tuned. Got it. Sean Carroll says, in response to that, well, fine tuning only promotes naturalism, not supernaturalism, because fine tuning is talking about laws of nature. Ah, well, okay. supernatural okay. doesn't need laws of nature. God doesn't have right. to abide by the laws of nature. Right. He's a weak if, God if he can't. Right. You know, yeah. If you work by magic, you don't need to do fine tuning. You can just right. say, I am a magic supernatural being. This exists now. Deal with it. Right. You don't have to make exactly. little rules and variables. Yeah, stuff. God could have made us out of titanium to live in the interstellar space. Exactly. And, uh, it doesn't or make us out of people's ribs. Requires. Right? Yeah. Yes, huh? right. Or just magically make us out of yep. people's ribs. There yeah. you go. Yeah, just yeah. well, you know, ahead. something that kind of takes the wind out of uh, the fine tuning argument is uh, the fact that uh, ninety nine point nine 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 followed by twenty zeros um, or 20, 20 other nines is uninhabitable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, most of the universe is uninhabitable. Not and even, even if un- and even if you think about on Earth. <laughs> You know, 2,000 meters below sea level, 8,000 meters above sea level, your history. So, you know, fine tuning, it doesn't doesn't really cut it. Larry, go for it. Uh, Yeah, they were talking about, you know, if the fine tuning constants were not exactly right, the universe would have collapsed. Well, there could have been 100 billion other universes before this one that did collapse because they had the wrong fine tuning parameters. That's a good point. And then, you know, there's no observers in those universes because they didn't persist. We have one example. We have hmm? one. We have an end of one. one, right one we example. have one example that it did persist, <laughs> yeah. uh, and therefore we were able to evolve in it. But that doesn't mean that there weren't, you know, yeah. countless other ones before that. Multiverses. I'm right. also going to throw this and, out too. I'm, I, I like to get George's opinion on this because it's not just that the 99.999 on end is uninhabitable. It's actively hostile to right. human life. Even if you were in that small fraction. You could have a neighbor you don't get along with. Isn't that right, George? You could have like, (laughs) you could have the, you could have giant corporations trying to extract your information. And stuff like well, that. the problem is that I do get along with the neighbor. You know? okay, okay, okay. That's the whole, the whole other thing. Uh-huh. I would always say, like, um, you could be a human being and be Jewish, and then you're like, oh, well, now it's, I'm back at square one again. Like, what am I supposed yeah. to do? Like, it's, it's rough. Larry. Yeah. And even if it was a fine tuner, I mean, what gets me is that uh, 
religious people, believers, whatever, automatically jump to that fine tuner was their God. Mm -hmm. It could have been any God. It doesn't point to any particular God. It could even be a God that we've never heard of, you know, a God of the universe 16 times over, you know, creating universes left and right. We don't know. It, it and, just points to a deistic God. Or, or it could just point to a series of constants and variables that can be measured and studied by very objective tests. That don't yeah, but I was just saying, anything. even if it was a God, you know, oh, it doesn't totally, mean totally. it has to be any particular but, God. But a lot of people will, there are beyond that will point to like a spiritualistic idea of science as mm. the forces that are controlling their life. But it's like <laughs> science doesn't even care about like, have you looked at the universe? Science is a tool for us to use. It has no intention of keeping us alive. We right. can use it oh, yeah. to best figure out how to live ourselves, but it's not here to guide us toward a better path. It's a tool for us to make use of to get to that path ourselves. And right. I, one of the unfortunate things about this, this principle that I don't like is it tends to overlook the work that's put into discovering these constants and variables and how we've made use of it. I can't tell you the number of times where I've seen like a pastor being like, I'm just so thankful for everything. And he's in a room that's incredibly immaculately well lit. And, and they are very careful with how they light mega churches. Like there's make sure there's no cast a shadow underneath their eyes. They don't cast too big of a shadow. They have the diffusion going on. They have the echo speaking into mics. You can't even see it's all Bluetooth controlled. The, the, the room are perfectly sound designed. Every single one of those scientific facets were made by a couple of engineers in a room overnight trying to figure out the best way to carve angles, best way to set up a wiring, yeah. best way to have lights. People worked at that. And there's a history of work that went into each of those scientific things. So it's that when we flip a light switch, we don't thank God for that. We're like, but we, we ignore the fact that people put work into it. And mm -hmm. so very easy to think, Oh, this universe was made for me because I am ignorant of the amount of effort that was put into crafting it as it is now. And it, it would highly humble us first be recognizing mm -hmm. cognizant of that. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'm hearing is, is that um, you're, you're talking about a, a religious leader who is not being thankful for mm. all the scientific work that's been done to make him superhuman yeah. to everybody else. You know, yeah. I mean, the, uh, I, I want to mention a, a point of history here that, um, you know, in, in, in this co conversation, I've been, I've been thinking about um, uh, aspects of my own life that, that to intersect on what we're discussing and, and the, the thoughts kind of come and go. But, but the one thing I wanted to mention um, that I'm aware of has to do with Adolf Hitler and magnetic recording tape. The, um, the Nazis, the, the Germans anyway, scientists perfected magnetic recording during the 1930s with a certain um, electronic principle that made it all happen. And I won't get into that. Um, it's too technical, but they made it possible to record on magnetic tape. And so what they did with that was they put Hitler on the air at all hours of day or night. They played recordings of him wide awake at two o'clock in the morning, just blasting away out of his mouth, you know? And so this made him seem superhuman. He could be up at two, three o'clock in the morning, screaming his head off, you know? Yep. It and made everybody relate to him without him having to relate with anybody. It made him essentially a celebrity of thought. And super, there are super good human. parallels to this today. But anyway, sorry for... Yeah, so, oh. I mean, it, it's just um, that particular invention hmm. made it possible for, for him to do that. And, and for the, I interviewed with a company that makes loudspeakers that are used in megachurches. And, and as you said, Tyrone, a, a tremendous amount of brilliant scientific work went into those loudspeakers. You know, the same speakers are used for rock concerts. Mm, sure, and they're extremely good. And um, so, yeah, I'm I, I'm just re relating to that. I've thought this myself from time yeah. to time. A lot of work goes in, and we should just be more thankful to the people who made this because it'll better color the amount of collaborative effort to make. The universe as we see it, the tools that we used to see it, and the and the, what we appreciate much more visible. Well, it's my not... neighbor, who I speak about from oh, time no. to time. Oh no! Oh no! He, see, he he went and had stents put in his arteries, and uh, 
uh, God for it when it was over instead of the doctor? <laughs> well, well, I was thinking more like um, the degradation of science that has gone on for the last four years right. in this country. And, um, and the fact was that he did not go to his car mechanic to have the stents put in his arteries. He did not go to his pastor to have the stents put in his arteries. He went to a doctor. Cool. Yeah, doctors, exactly. You don't go to a pastor for stuff like that. You go to a doctor. Right. Yeah, anyway, that's my point. <laughs> Scott, you raise your hand. What's up? Yeah, so um, in response to um, that statement <clears throat> that, um, you know, science <clears throat> is kind of the empower, empower of religionists who use technology like the internet or the church floor or the church building or whatever it is, the microphones, the thing, you know, science is sort of enabling Christianity and Christianity turns or, or any theism turns around and gives all praise to God mm. rather than the scientists. And so that point has been made a lot of times, you know, and what I've found is that a lot of apologists now are trying to bring up the point that, wait, wait a minute now, most scientists are Christians. Whoa, here we All go. of the <laughs> science that was done from Newton on up, they were Christians. Oh, why start so from there? Trying, why start from there? Right. There were so many more scientists before that one white dude. <laughs> yeah. right, exactly, exactly. And they'll say, look, so when you try to say that, you know, science versus, um, you know, our Christian God, well, wait a minute. The, the same scientists, these same things are, were, science was created by Christians. Oh, I so heard. how dare yeah. you try to pit us again? So, you know, it's just something I thought I'd bring up. But I, I think that that's kind of a, a, a ironic argument to make, being that a lot of Christians used to burn scientists alive right. at the stake. Yep, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's an argument ad populum, I believe. It's just, hey, a lot mm -hmm. of people believe this, therefore it's true. That's not necessarily the case. So yeah. I'm yeah. for an yeah. argument. Mm -hmm. the, um, I was going to say, um, it, it's it's like Oz, right? The, the, the state of churches these days is really like Oz behind the curtain. Are you and saying that, pogs? Oz, 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 the great and powerful Wizard, Wizard of, Oz. of Oz. Oh, Wizard Oz, 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 behind the curtain. Yes. Oz, Oz. Behind the curtain. Yeah. Don't, kid, look, sorry, don't pay attention to that man behind the curtain, sort of thing. Right. <laughs> and, and that's what they do in these big mega yeah. churches nowadays. Mm -hmm. But what, what I thought was uh, a bit of a peeve I have is uh, I, I watched this show called Mayday, which is about uh, air crashes and air accidents and whatnot. And I saw the one recently about uh, Sully who landed uh, his plane in the um, Hudson mm. River. Mm. And survivors saying, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> thank God I made it. Thank I have thank a purpose. God, God wants me to live on for some purpose. Training like, regimen. No, 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 no. Like, stop, stop. <laughs> yeah, so we need the Church of Sully. Or yeah, the church is so. Yeah. I want. I want to throw this before we head out to a break because I think it's a good final point to rest on, at least before we come back to the subject. But when a pastor is like, "Hey, I have good news," he's only talking to his flock. He's only talking to his people. But science is for literally everybody. Once right. a discovery is made, there's no dissection of people. There's no segregation. It's for everybody, which means people can misuse it. And people do misuse it. But science, like I said, doesn't have the goal of saying you might these people first, these people second. It is literally as open and objective for everybody if they're willing to put in the work. So even if you are subject to like misinformation by people that you trust and care about, you have the means to figure out how to parse their truth and facts on your own because science is available to you too if you're listening to this. Larry, final thoughts before we head out to the break. What do you got? Oh, I just go back to uh, the science was created by Christians. Uh, the science that um, supported Christianity was okay. The science that didn't support Christianity, like the Earth-centered universe or the Sun-centered universe, uh, that type of thing, uh, you could kill the scientists. You could in house imprison them. You could. Uh, uh, banish their works and, and burn their books. Uh, you know, it all depends. It took 500 years for the um, Catholic Church to uh, apologize for, um, what was it, 
Galileo's works, you know, yeah. and, and oh, imprisoning yeah. him. You yeah. know, it, it and it wasn't the religion that that uh, made them apologize for it. It was the science and uh, popular opinion finally catching up with the science. Mm -hmm. So we have to be aware that um, Christianity didn't do much for science uh, other than, you know, rubber stamping it when they got around to approving it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, when they, when these preachers, like uh, there was a, a monk who actually came up with the idea, I think, of uh, using peas of evolution. You know, say, ah, oh, one of our people discovered evolution. No, he didn't discover uh, the the correct tool that evolution uses. And he wasn't doing religion when he when he found that principle. Uh, he was doing uh, science while uh, he was a religious person. You're talking about Mendel, it's, right? Yes. We just need to keep that in mind. Were they doing religion when they made those discoveries, or were they doing science? Right. And how many discoveries did religion per se actually bring forward? Right. Yeah, Hero. I'm ready That's for a break. Genetic fallacy. Yeah. Huh? It's like... Uh, Something is right or wrong depending on the source. You know, that's a right. Terrible. Did you say Mendel? Yeah. That's a Jewish name, man. <laughs> he was the guy that did the work on peas. But... Oh, awesome. Awesome. Um, okay, you ready for a break? Let's do it. Okay, this is the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LP FM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we'll be right back. 103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Hello, and welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Dowder Five, and we're on WOZO Radio 103.9 LP FM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, this is the morning of Sunday, April 25th, 2021. Now let's talk about our Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK. Founded in 2002, we're in our 19th year. ASK has over a thousand members, and we have weekly Zoom meetings uh, during this COVID, COVID outbreak. Uh, you can find us online on eight, I'm sorry, on Facebook, meetup.com, or Knox, or uh, Google, for that matter. Just do a search for KnoxvilleAtheist.org, or again, you'll be able to find us. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to Meetup and search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one? Start one! That's right. Wombat, where do we want to pick up? Uh, we apparently got a bunch of listener comments, and so we may have to dedicate an entire episode to this for the next oh. show, because cool. I didn't get a chance to read all of them, and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you don't know if it's just a guy being like, hey, that was a good thing, or like a bunch of people debating at the same time, too. But uh -huh. we well, let's, let's try to dedicate next show to uh, just some comments. We'll catch up on them. Thank you for them. Um, Feel free to leave more comments in the show. Just just leave them at the our YouTube channels or reach out to us at the links that we'll provide at the end of the show. And we are happy for them. Thank you very much for it. But I have, I'm going to put some bones. It's time to pick some bones. Uh, my problem with bone picking is uh, people, so we were talking about anthro principle. Anthropic. Anthropic, Anthropic Anthropic principle, principle right? And Scott had brought up people using uh, concepts to as like stop gaps for ignorance, like string theory or multiverse. And people just throw them out. And then Christians throwing out God, which tends to be like one of the biggest stop gaps that there all are. But I have, I have my pet peeves on God. You guys, <laughs> you guys are fairly aware of them, but I would like to address some of these other ones like multiverse. What my, my idea of what people mean when they say multiverse is like, and this falls into anthrop uh, uh, anthropic principle is like, well, I could have chosen to get Pepsi or Coca-Cola, but because I chose Coca-Cola, I inadvertently made an entirely new universe where there's another version of me who has Coca-Cola. I'm like, <laughs> how do you, just decided to make soda, make an entirely new universe. Like, well, you know, I just make universes with every choice I make. Every human right. being does it. I'm like, how does that, how is that a thing? It's you know, <laughs> so self-fulfilling so to say that, but isn't that like so saccharine that you can obviously tell it's a lie? Like, isn't that just straight up playing to a person's ego to being like, yeah, I cut my hair today. I made a new universe. I went with a goatee today. Made hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I farted in class. I made another universe. It was a whole universe where I didn't make fart in class. Who knows? Multiverse. Right. That's how it works. Guys. <laughs> Scott, what do you think? 
Sean Carroll would have your head for that statement. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, this universe where he wouldn't have his head. Yeah, I feel yeah, like exactly. it goes to the puddle idea of like, this universe was made for me. I'm just making universes left and right. It's like, no, dude, that's what are you talking about? Like, we yeah. got. Yeah. That's, uh, and see, that's got, the thing. Sean, Sean Carroll has, I don't think he expected as much blowback from other scientists and other philosophers that say the same exact thing you're, you're saying here. Hmm. And he's like, wait a minute, why are you guys saying this to me? Like, he doesn't get it. Like he, like he honestly doesn't understand, like, look, I've got valid mathematics It's peer reviewed. There's no contradictions in my math on it. What's the problem? It's true. Yeah. 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 But it, I just and have a not, and, right. And he's saying, you know, I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying it's valid. It's a, it's another model that should be treated with as much respect but so many people do not respect because it's like you said, it's kind of comes off kind of ego, kind of anthro, you know, anthrom anthropomorphic or. Uh, <laughs> it's a so hard word to say, Dred. I'm saying <laughs> it comes off as a puddle in a, in a puddle shaped hole, basically. That's right. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, it's like, like no. I think what you're, you're trying to say, you're trying to play the theologian game with a lot of <laughs> scientific word salad. And it just we, doesn't, we, it's something doesn't seem right about it, but exactly. It, and it's the, it's the same about intelligent design, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's, it's trying to put a scientific spin on a supernatural. Right. Um, idea. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's metaphysics. Larry, what do you yeah, think? I have yeah. a, I have a hard time with the new age people using terms like higher vibration or oh, quantum yeah. quantum yeah. Is, or so automatically huge. putting, uh, um, what is an intelligence in any energy they happen to encounter? Boom! Right. There you go. That I hate kills that. me. Yeah, that, that pet peeves me. Agency, no end. Mm. It's hard to describe in sign language. I know I had a conversation yeah. about pet peeves yeah. in sign language two weeks ago, and I don't have enough words to express <laughs> the small things upset me. But Larry, uh, mm. what do you think of the idea of multiverses? Do you, how many universes have you made today? You went to get tea over the break, for example. Oh, God, there was a yes, universe sorry. where you did it. Mm -hmm. Now we got these two spiraling universes where you might be an evangelical Christian by now, and this other one where you're just <laughs> like an artist. It's really possible because I, I was born a, a Christian into a Christian family. I, you were you know, born in a Christian family. You were not born. There's Christian. a universe where I didn't meet Hill in college, and therefore I stayed in my religion. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah. And, so, and now uh, we would have a thousand more Christians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it's a nice idea. I don't know if I go with that mm. but uh it sounds pretty far-fetched uh, even you know it's like what you were saying about a valid argument versus a true argument you know it right. can be valid but right we just may not know the flaw in it right, mm -hmm. right. whatever the answer is going to be i kind of feel like it's going to sound far-fetched let's just put it that way because if it wasn't we would have probably already had the answer right so that's not part of my thinking is that if it sounds far-fetched because that'd be kind of like a argument from personal incredulity like mm, for some evolution right. is kind of far-fetched yeah. to them but right. that's just because it's personally <laughs> incredible for them to believe it right. doesn't mean it's not true right you know right so yeah. I, I think that part of it i, I kind of learned how to separate that but the problem for me is that you've got that's just one interpretation like there's there's a lot of models on the table and you can't just arbitrarily pick one over the other because it feels good to you or it kind of sounds like a great stopgap argument. They're all stopgap arguments. They're all models that attempt to do the same thing. And I think that in, at the end of the day, people who conclude one over the other, it just depends on their philosophical um, you know, commitments. And or for biases. me, I'm more yeah. of an agnostic. I kind of just say, look, I don't know which one, if any of them are right. I'm going to, I'm going to break it down. Uh, objective truth may never be reached by any model. Cause I, I said models and universal truth or objective truths, they aren't the same thing. So you'll never, you'll get close, but at best you can do is get the difference to be nominal, which is like, yeah, there's a difference, but it's not that important for what we're trying to get done. So what really matters in science, as far as a model it, in models terms, it's utility. How useful is this model mm -hmm. and how much work do I have to put into this model to get an answer that's nominally close to objective truth. And I find like there are a lot of different models, but there's very, very rare exceptions for when you have 
uh, all of the models being as useful. Typically, there's just one use, very, very useful model that we can continue <clears> to improve <throat> on. And that's what we have now. So like, if I wanted to measure what time it was today, I can use a sundial. Like that, that gives me like one means of determining time. I could look at wax falling out of like a bowl and, and having it like offset a weight. That's, that's how they did it in Greek times. Or I can use a digital clock, which is really amazing, which is <laughs> like a radio control digital clock. Sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes it's not necessarily accurate. Sometimes it's a little bit off. Could be off by a couple of atom, you know, firing isotopes. And it's but sometimes it's, it's a rare occasion that um, we actually find utility out of some of these crazy ideas. Like one of them was there, there's this, um, it came out of relativity, was this block universe theory. It's called event ontology. Basically, the crazy idea that the universe is not comprised of things as we might intuitively think, like things and causation which is kind of the, which ironically is the basis of understanding a lot of scientific concepts. This thing causes that thing and that thing causes this thing. But fundamentally that's not true from event ontology. And a lot of scientists were like, well, that's just crazy talk. But then they made predictions. Could you describe it in a nutshell so so everyone can follow? It's kind of like things are mainly coordinates. It's all based on relations, not causation. Those are two different things. And it's kind of deep to get into for the show. But basically, it's about relations and events. Those are the only real things, not things themselves, which is kind of a weird, really weird, unintuitive idea. But then, you know, then the, then the thing was, well, how would you prove something like that's really the truth? And they said, well, we make testable novel predictions. And part of the predictions that came out of that is time dilation. If this is true, then time dilation is a thing. And now we have GPS based on event ontology. And so correction, correction, correction. Cause yeah. you can come up. So two models can point to the same thing, right? Like I could, and, and, and even if one model points to something doesn't mean that the other model couldn't do the exact same thing. Right. And I feel like right. we've developed so, GPS through, through causational science, or at least much more traditional means of science. And if this new model does point to the same thing too, I'm totally fine with it. But, but what, what do you mean thing- by GPS? GPS, the global positioning, and the thing about it is in science, it's whoever makes the prediction first who is who wins. Like, no, if if someone comes with a model after post hoc to explain it, that doesn't count. No, what I understand. Um, No, absolutely not. I understand it doesn't count. No, 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 absolutely not. A lot of people came up with evolution before Darwin did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He came up with a with a method of explaining how it worked. And yeah, even Lamar he got it, and even he was wrong until we figured out what genes were and what punctuated equilibria was, and and germ theory. Like these are right. Not a the lot theory. Of... I'm talking about the prediction, the predictions. Like if if a model, like let, let's say I say, um, if gravity is true, I'm going to predict that if I drop this pen, it's going to fall. If I'm the first one, and I say this thing is called gravity, and I have a whole explanation for how it works, and they say, well, prove it, and then I drop the pen, and it works. But then someone else later says, ah, but maybe it happens because fairies actually come in, invisible fairies, and they push it down, and that's what causes the pen to fall to the ground. So our model also explains it. Well, that would be like a post hoc explanation, which doesn't count as evidence. That's from what I understand. I might be wrong, though, but that's, that's what I understand it to be. We don't, have to get, we don't have to get too far into it. What I really just was, as my takeaway is, different models can point to the same thing, but mm-hmm. what we would prefer is one model that explains everything. And right now we have a lot of different models in science. And the umbrella of science mm-hmm. contains many, many different models. And we try to explain big forces and small forces. And we have so many different formulas and so many different things. And the goal of science, like the day when science ends, is when there's one formula that explains everything it's like the grand mm-hmm. universal theorem yeah, the right. theory of everything. we yeah. may never get there it's a pie in the sky sort of thing but until then we know what that would look like even if it's very complicated it's a very useful singular model that's reliable for everything until then though yeah. we work with the next best useful system which is what's the most useful meth or uh model to explain why guitar strings make noise or why gravity works and we will go to the areas of expertise and 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 figure out what are the best models that you guys are using to to explain these phenomena and if someone says fairies we're like 
what else can fairies explain? Basically everything. It's like, oh, I'm very skeptical mm. now. Right. <laughs> right. If we don't yeah, have that. Exactly. We don't have that yet. We will look mm -hmm. a little bit past what else that model explains. If it can only explain one thing and something that we can't test or measure, that's a problem. But if we yeah. can't explain everything, I would just say this mm -hmm. before we have to dread, if we can't explain everything with a particular model that we have right now, like if it's limited, that's okay because there's room in science for I don't know and it's undefined. And I think that's something that as a culture we need to get used to, that there's a lot of unknowns in, even in science, even with the best models that we have out right now. And that's okay. It means we can still continue to improve this process and model that we have. Dread? <laughs> yeah, so a really good example, of course, is the two competing models of uh, how the solar system worked, Copernican and Galilean, right? So, um, you know, those two models were in, in, in competition until the one that better explained the phenomenon won out. And that was the process of science, scientific discovery. Um, so, and the evidence, and the evidence, the evidence to support it was the predictions it made. Correct. And it seems like with with a model that can make more predictions than another, that can be verified and repeated over and over and over, that counts as better evidence than one that doesn't do that. That's correct, what I'm correct, saying. correct. Yeah. Yep. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so uh, I the same same thing with uh, Ed Eddington and uh, Einstein. Uh, the uh, the um, the shift there, the the bending of light uh, mm -hmm. from Mercury mm -hmm. um, around the sun that mm -hmm. was predicted mm -hmm. by Einstein but was only proved eventually through an experiment by Eddington. I love that story. Uh -huh. I love that story because he was out there to disprove the craziness of that theory. Like, this is just ridiculous, and I'll prove it. And he went out there and got a, the exact opposite. He didn't opposite sound like that. Result. That's a terrible person. He's rolling this way right <laughs> yeah. uh, and In more culturally relevant, or in more recent terms, there was an argument on, believe it or not, um, is intelligence heretically genetically transferred between parents to kids. And that was a thing people still believe it up to now. People are still arguing for that up to now. But the thing is like, uh, it, the idea is if you have two intelligent people and they have a baby, that baby's going to be intelligent too. But I think what we are overlooking is that there's a lot of social in, in factors that lead towards intelligence. It's like the same thing as saying, if you have a rich mom and dad, you're going to have a rich baby. It's like, yeah, but that's not genetic. That's just upbringing. Maybe they make different choices in life. Maybe they have the access to different things. Maybe but... they just inherit their money. <laughs> just inherit the money. That's not genetic. Maybe no. it could be they don't inherit learning disabilities. Maybe they mm -hmm. they're less in inclined to ha to get mental disorders that might mm -hmm. um, exacerbate things as they try to learn things. But we science says science says on the matter we don't know because there's no gene we can put on a, on a Petri dish and say, ah, oh, this is the intelligence gene. At this point, it's just a thing that science isn't sure of, but there's no grounding to make the argument for. And people are using that as basis to say, aha, well, then there is possibility that it could be uh, genetically transferred, therefore it is. And it's like, ooh, that's not what science is saying, though. Oh, uh, it makes me upset. It's like, you can't prove what you're at. You can't prove for or against it. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's proof positive for it just means this is an inconclusive result until you can actually put the genes that you're talking about on a petri dish and we can actually do some measurements with right. organisms that after we disable them or turn them on or off and stuff like that until then you're just saying words so that means i'm right right it's like no ah! <laughs> well, they're good words so ah! good words yeah i feel like a lot of Feels things good. I feel like a lot of things in science that really make me upset is just the idea that most people don't realize that it's not a magical wand that makes them right for the things that they strongly believe and want to be true. It is just a tool that has its limitations. And the more you work with it, the more you realize, oh man, there's so many blank spots that we have not illuminated yet, which is exciting if you are want to get to get into science but is also illustrative of the fact that it's not as powerful enough to make the supernatural real real exactly right. mm -hmm. beautiful yeah. beautifully well, i think there's a problem in definitions like what does supernatural even mean hmm. yeah i gotta like, how do you I, distinguish oh let's leave it to george george i haven't heard from you in a while what do you think the supernatural even is don't say i have no idea <laughs> I have no idea. Define. The supernatural is, well, I, I will define it by what it isn't. Okay. Okay. It isn't science. 
Very and true. It is natural. <laughs> Super. Super. And I, I mean, some, sometimes to... you have to. Sometimes when you're when you're defining something, you have to look at what it isn't, and it's, and go from there. Nice. And this is one. I think morals and ethics. They'll say morals and ethics are not science. science no, no. Sense. Don't twist the word. Oh. Don't twist the word. Like it's not. It's not strictly measured with incredibly well-defined variables in the in the field of ethics and morals or alternatively what uh george brown is alluding to can actually be systematically measured and is tied to the laws of logic and reason like everything we measure in science is in part accessible through reasonable tools of observation and other yeah, otherwise it's just a non-observable facet of so life would you say more so would you say moral claims are science can be scientifically validated? Yeah, I don't have a moral button detector that I can push a button and be like, yeah, that was right. that was morally correct or wrong. I have to use a different thought process, and that's up to subjectivity at that point. Hey, what's up, Larry? I think we need to make a decision on whether philosophy is a science or not, because we're mm -hmm. talking about morality and, and ideas and, and yeah. You know, the type of thing is, is usually there are a lot by, of different kinds of philosophies. Philosophy. Yeah, I got yeah. my PhD, or which is a philosophy, a degree in philosophy, but right. it's <laughs> it is in very much an aspect of putting a lot of thought into something, mm -hmm. and and I feel like that's what the nature of philosophy is. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. if you put a lot well, of thought into it, that's philosophy. But uh, mm -hmm. the philosopher, the the etymology of that word is actually lover of knowledge. Yeah, a philosopher is a lover of knowledge. So that's why you could be a PhD in in all kinds of different subjects, uh, because that's what it's defined as, as a lover of knowledge. Hmm. One scientist named uh, Lawrence Krauss says he hates philosophy. And he says, philosophy <laughs> has no, there's no need for philosophy. Philosophy is just dumb. You know what, I, I hate really cursing. Hate but you know what, he hangs out with Daniel Bennett. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. They need to but take curses out of school isn't first. Isn't there a that's philosophy of science, though? There is a philosophy. There is a philosophy of science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in a lot of, a lot of ways, what we do in science is philosophy because science again is just a tool it's just a, a box of tools and you have to put it on a table and use philosophy to apply them appropriately to solve problems if that's what your intentions are mm -hmm. so in moral well put well put thank you thank you in moral in more ideas of moral you are using philosophy because you're looking for tools that aren't necessarily like as as equipable as like scientific tools like i can't cut i can't the tech, I can't use spectroscopy. I can't weigh. I have to, I have to really reason out processes with mental models and talk to people and understand what are your, what's your consent? What do you want to have? What are our mutual goals and what can we do to improve our mutual benefit of a, of a situation that may not necessarily have a clean, perfect answer to, to make everybody happy. That is a philosophy in its own right. And it comes out to murky answers sometimes, but what, what is cool about science, math, and philosophy is they have very, very different standards of the, what I call declarative truths. Math can say, this is three, this is four, because those terms are so incredibly well-defined. We know what a three is, we know what a four is. Science can say, I built a model to suggest that this is three, and we are very, very conclusive that this is three. We can even make a law. A lot might change in the future, but we, well, I'm saying a law because it's more than a theory, we can demonstrate it, but it might change in the future, but we are very, very certain that it, that is the case, right? Mm -hmm. It's a little less certain, but it's still pretty close to it. And I feel like in philosophy, it's more of like, here's just this idea that we've come to terms with as the best way to, to behave if certain events happen. And, and whether or not it's right or wrong isn't really the question. It's more of just like, here's the thought process that we're using. And it's up to us to decide if we consent into the system of governance or not. Uh, so it establishes like a little framework. Yes. It's a, a, like a societal contract in a way. Mm -hmm. And, and right. they have very, very different goals. And so because of that, it's good that you have different philosophies that are answering different subjects and different things. And they can all borrow from each other. And I think that's the beauty of life. But I think what the biggest question in the world is, is what is that giant pile of stuff behind you, Scott? Is Did he drop a bunch of fingernail clippings behind you? What's going on? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 These are cough medicine. I, I've got bronchitis this uh, weekend. Uh -huh. So I'm hopped up on uh, medication. So I thought so, it was just a pile of pills that he dropped over? Yeah, just brought some uh, cough drops <laughs> and some pills. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Don't mix them up. Don't mix them up. Don't mix them up. That's right. Anyway. Uh, Larry, we're getting close to the end of the show. I want to get some final thoughts from you. I'm thinking um, 
the idea of philosophies and there being more than one science, math, philosophy, those are like the main ones I can think of right now. Do you think there are other important ones that we should be aware of? No, I, no, nothing comes to mind. Mm. Uh, what's, what's interesting about philosophy is back a long time ago, like back during Greek times and before that, uh, they actually had the view that uh, to solve problems of the you know, physical problems of the world, uh, all you really had to do was just think about it. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they would think that, you know, thought processes could, could find the answer on any particular problem, like how the earth goes around the sun or vice versa, or <clears throat> the distance around the earth, or, you know, just if they thought about it, they could, they could discern it. The thing about it is they, they gave credence to supernatural beings. Sure. And that's where the, you know, even Plato went off on that road. Plato. So, See, I told you yeah. we'd get back to the, 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 the characters. Yeah. Little Plato. Yeah. Uh, Pluto. But, I'm trying to, I'm trying and to and just because it hasn't been said today, <laughs> Sam Harris. Boo. Yeah. Boo's Sam right. Harris. All right. <laughs> hey, actually, I'd like to touch on what George was saying earlier in the show when he had made the mention of that magnetic strip tape and, and Adolf Hitler. Um, we very much construct the world that we live in through our observations and what we decide to take in as information, right? And that could be a bad thing in some cases if we use it, if we were fed bad information, it could be a good thing if we we ideally have good information. And what science does is help to separate the two. It's a very, very useful tool. It's like a little flipper. It's like, that's true, that's not true, that's true, that's not true. I don't know yet, I'm not putting in the two pile. Doesn't mean it's false, it's just its own special basket. And we'll, and we'll parse that when we have a better system and we can, and we can go through it again. But in the event that you, in the event that you may not feel as happy or feel as, as calm about the state of, 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 of the world and stuff like that, you have access to a brilliant method of parsing true and, 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 and falsehoods that's available to you because science is available to everybody, but also you have control of, to an extent of coloring the world that you do live in with, with useful, healthy, and not as exploitatively dramatic, is, if I can put it in a nice way, information from news media that's not really news media, <laughs> that's more interested in selling dog food commercials than actually mm-hmm. t- than informing you. Uh, so be careful what you digest. Have like a good mental diet. And that's a good way to stay like mentally sound and healthy, I think. And science is a very, very apt tool for that. I have a three-step rule. If someone's wearing a funny hat, <laughs> or if they tell you don't eat bacon. <laughs> and then I haven't come up with the third one yet, but it probably involves something with like, and where, do, where they start asking you for money. Like those people, yeah. typically, those people <laughs> typically aren't in, interested in informing you in the best way that you could be informed. So be aware of that. Funny hat, no bacon, wait for the money ask. All right, that's it. Mm-hmm. Dread, yeah. final yeah. thoughts, what do you think? Um, well, I... I uh, would like to encourage people, if they're so inclined, uh, to maybe pick up some David Hume. Um, he was uh, a, a Scottish uh, philosopher of the uh, 19th, 19th century, or 18th, 18th century, sorry, um, best known for his uh, uh, philosophical empiricism, skepticism, and naturalism. Very and nice. every day I've, I've been reading this treatise on uh, human understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I go to the local pub and I have a glass of wine and that's where I get my Hume in. Get it? My human. Oh, get my Hume in. oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Scott, last words. What do you got? Uh, well, tonight I'm going to actually be debating, uh, the fine tuning argument with a Christian on a YouTube channel called James is Tired tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Very cool. So I thought this would be a good subject to kind of talk about while I'm getting prepped up for it, get my mind on it, get focused in on it. Cool. And I appreciate all the input. Very, very nice. Very nice. And good luck to you. I hope you have a good, enjoyable chat, in my opinion. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, George, final thoughts before we head out. I don't have any this week. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. We hope we can see you next week, George. Uh, yeah. Fred, what's up? I just wanted to mention, uh, because I, I know I, I forgot last time, was to uh, 
mention my uh, YouTube channel, Mind Pirate. Yeah. That uh, we do this on Sunday morning, um, 8 a.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time. And uh, you can check us out live. And he's almost close to 100 subscribers. So please subscribe yeah, to his channel. Yeah, please subscribe. That's M I N D. It's not Standard Time. P Y R A T. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Larry, why don't you close us out? Okay. Oh, uh, wait, I'd my like bad, to... my bad. I didn't get a chance to close. I'm sorry. My yeah, bad, yeah. my bad. Just real quick. Okay. Hey, okay. I did some car stuff. I fixed my car. I had this whole problem with a leaky coolant water outlet for my coolant. It was spraying hit, hot mist everywhere. I, I got the part on Amazon for like 20 bucks. I put it in myself. I just did a test drive today. Everything looks good. Thank God. My car now <laughs> magically starts working again. That's, that's what solved everything. Larry, go ahead and take us out. Okay. I that just felt like weird. To, I haven't uh, said that in a long while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, rec I'd like to recommend that everybody look up Robert G. Ingersoll. Uh, he's a very popular 19th century skeptic. He was called the great agnostic of his time. And he has a lot of uh, free text on the internet. Uh, a lot of his works is, is available. And he, he's a very prolific writer. Um, my own content is found at digitalfreethought.com. Be sure to click on the blog button for our radio show archives, atheist songs, and many articles on the subject of atheism. Uh, you can find my YouTube channel by searching for Doubter5 or Digital Free Thought Radio. My book is called Atheism, What's It All About? And it's available on Amazon. And if you have a question for the show, you can send them by email to askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org, and we'll answer them on future shows. If you're having trouble relieving religious beliefs behind, having emotional or even physical problems with people uh, trying when you're trying to leave religion, you can go to recoveringfromreligion.org and get help. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. Uh, oh, we haven't mentioned this in a while. If you'd like to see how Jesus might have done his miracles uh, or magic tricks, if you want to look at them that way, uh, explained by stage magic, then read the free book by Dale Newman, 30 Pieces of Silver Plus Expenses, which can be found at how did, HowJesusDidIt.com. It's free, and you can read it online. This has been the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Remember, everybody is going to somebody else's hell. But the time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life. We'll see you next Wednesday. Say bye, everybody. Bye, bye everybody. Everybody. <laughs> see you guys.